Hello. Welcome to the season opening virtual program of the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. I'm Anil Kashup. I'm a member of the society and I'll be moderating today's program. We're meeting virtually out of concern for everyone's health and safety, and we look forward to being able to resume our in-person meetings when it's safe to do so. But in the meantime, we're grateful to be able to connect with each other on Sundays via our YouTube channel. If you're new to us, here's one definition of humanism that might help you understand us a bit. Humanism is a method of inquiry, which some might even propose as its first principle, a commitment to the use of critical intelligence and rational inquiry in the understanding of the world and in solving problems. The hypothetical deductive method includes some form of skepticism. The humanist recognizes that one's not infallible, that human knowledge is often difficult to discover, that the truth is the product of give and take of competing views, and therefore one may be mis mistaken in one's point of view. One must constantly be willing to revise one's beliefs in the light of criticism, even radically so. That came from Paul Kurtz, who was the former editor of the Humanist magazine. Um, today, um, you'll, you'll see one of the many types of programs that we talk about. We cover a wide variety of topics, including current events, philosophy, arts, sciences, just to name a few. Today's presentation is going to be part of our ongoing programming related to politics. Um, to deliver it, we're delighted to have a return appearance by Eric Posner. Eric's the Kirkland and Ellis Distinguished Service Professor of Law and the Arthur K. Uh, Esther Kane Research Chair, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Law Institute. His research uh, interests include financial regulation, international law, and constitutional law, but that's really only the tip of the iceberg. If I counted correctly, he had 15 books, and today he's going to talk about his latest one, The Demagogue's Playbook, The Battle for American Democracy from the Founders to Trump. So without further ado, here's Eric. Thanks so much, Anil. And it's terrific to be back, even if only in virtual form. But I hope to visit you again in person sometime, in, sometime soon. Um, just uh, before I start, we've had a variety of technical issues. So I'm, I'm actually using my iPhone uh, to uh, broadcast because my laptop didn't work. So if you see me kind of, you know, moving around and shaking and so forth, uh, that, that, that's why, and, I, and I, I apologize, but, uh, you know, we're all facing uh, technical problems these days, and it looks like uh, this system is working well enough. So um, let me uh, talk about this book I published uh, recently. It came out last June called The Demagogue's Playbook, and um, I wrote this book, uh, I, I began writing this book really shortly after uh, Donald Trump was elected. Uh, like, uh, you know, many people, I was surprised that he was elected. I was, I was surprised that he won the Republican um, primary. And then I was surprised again when he, when he won the, the uh, presidential election. And um, I have uh, written about presidential power over the years. Um, so I, you know, immediately began wondering, you know, what did it mean uh, for the presidency that uh, Donald Trump uh, was elected? And more broadly, what does it mean for American democracy? Now, I, I want to start by disclaiming any kind of partisan view. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing as, I, of course, I do have my own personal views, but I, I'm writing as an academic and um, I'm, I don't take a position, you know, in this book or, or, or I'm not going to take a position here about whether, you know, it's good to have high taxes or low taxes or anything like that. I'm, I'm trying to separate out the issue of uh, the nature of the presidency and the question of, you know, what you think the president uh, should do uh, with the power that he has. Um, so let's move on to slide uh, number two. So that, yeah, the next slide. So this will just give me roughly, uh, just give you roughly uh, uh, the plan today. This is really a historical book that goes back um, to the founding to look at how people have thought about the issue of demagoguery, in particular um, uh, in its connection to the presidency. Um, and then um, the reason I did this is that um, there's already a lot of writing about, um, you know, the problem of democracies having institutions that break down, 
Um, and a lot of this work is comparative. So people frequently, uh, people who really worry a lot about Trump, they often have in the back of their mind Weimar and Hitler, or to take sort of more modern examples, maybe Erdogan in Turkey or Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. But I, you know, I don't think the, I think these comparison, these comparisons, you know, are helpful to some extent, but Donald Trump is really an American phenomenon and he's, he's not really that new. There have been people like him in the past. And so I thought um, for the purpose of trying to understand what Donald Trump's presidency means for American democracy, it would be uh, useful to go back uh, through American history and see what um, our predecessors thought about the problem of demagoguery and, and what to do about it. And of course, I'm going to not just assume that uh, Trump is a demagogue. I'm not going to assume that, you know, all of the people who are watching this are opposed to Trump or didn't vote for him. Uh, I, I'm trying to put all of that to the side. I will talk in a little bit why I do think that uh, Donald Trump is a demagogue and uh, why that matters. But for now, I want to start um, at the beginning of uh, American history. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So um, a little bit about the founding. Uh, I, I think um, the, uh, the founders uh, themselves, uh, Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, they were worried about demagoguery. Uh, now, interestingly, they were not as worried about a demagogic president as they were worried about the general phenomenon of demagoguery. And the reason they were worried about demagoguery is that they were highly educated people who, in designing the American Constitution, drew on their knowledge of classical history, ancient Greek and Roman history, as well as, of course, you know, modern European history. But really, it was the classics that interested them, because um, in the 18th century, most European countries were, were effectively monarchy, monarch, monarchies or close to monarchies. They did not want to create a monarchy. They wanted to create a republic. And the famous republics were mostly um, uh, existed in uh, ancient Greece and, and then Rome. And plus, there were some uh, medieval republics and early modern republics like Venice. So they were kind of thinking about um, what are, you know, we want to create a republic. What, what are the risks that we undertake by implementing the republican form of government? And the risk, looking back through history, was pretty obvious, which was that um, a, de a demagogue would come to power. And the Greeks and the Romans themselves talked about demagoguery and worried about demagoguery. Um, and so what happened over and over again was that, you know, you had limited government in place, which was kind of like what we think of as democracy. So the people um, had, pardon me? The, the, oh, I'm sorry, just a, one second while I fix a problem here. So the, 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 um, um, the um, in, a, in a classical republic, it didn't really mean a democracy, but it did mean that the people would have a significant amount of influence on public policy, either in electing officials or, or directly. Um, and, uh, and this was considered a, you know, a good thing uh, because if the people weren't involved, then you had the problem of, of a usually a predatory aristocracy or, or monarch uh, exploiting the people uh, so as to enrich themselves. But the problem with the people were, was that the people were vulnerable to what they would call a demagogue. And what was distinctive about a demagogue was that this was a person who was immensely charismatic, who would make you know, promises of riches and other benefits in order to obtain people's votes. And then once in power would uh, destroy institutions, the courts and other institutions that people uh, regarded as valuable. This happened over and over in the ancient world. Famously, of course, the, uh, the Roman Republic, which had lasted for 500 years, collapsed when a demagogue Caesar uh, was able to obtain power through his, through his charisma. And I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen Shakespeare's play and, and Shakespeare's play, you know, it's not that historically accurate, but it does, you know, kind of reflect um, the, the worries of the founders. You might remember in the, in the play how easily, easily it was for Brutus and Cassius and others to sway the mob. You know, there are the people out there 
and they weren't very smart and they were easily swayed by emotion and great rhetoric. But, you know, if that's the case, you're not going to have a very strong government. So what the founders did is they, they self-consciously created what they what we, we might call bulwarks against demagoguery. And I mentioned earlier, by the way, that they weren't that they weren't so much, you know, maybe surprisingly concerned about a presidential demagogue. What they were really worried about at the time was what they called legislative tyranny, because in the immediate past, before they drafted the Constitution, the real problem were excessively powerful state legislatures and very weak governors. But, you know, the, the broader problem was, you know, power hungry politicians coming to power by manipulating uh, pop, uh, popular opinion. And, and a further fact about the founding, as the founders well understood, was that most Americans, you know, they were not well educated. They were actually, you know, pretty illiterate. Um, they were isolated, um, living on farms. Um, so they were a little bit worried about whether um, ordinary people would be able to exercise the wisdom to choose uh, good leaders and to avoid demagogues. So here were the solutions, these bulwarks, as I call them. The first was something that seems obvious today, but at the time was a, was a big part of their deliberations, was that we would have a representative democracy. And that didn't just mean that the people chose a representative, it meant that the people chose a wise representative, somebody with experience, someone who was educated. And it was hoped anyway uh, that ordinary uh, people would, would do that. But they were only allowed to do that with respect to the House. You know, they were allowed to directly elect members of the House, but um, senators were chosen by state legislatures, and the president was chosen through the Electoral College. Um, and I'll get back to those in a moment. But one other um, thing which, which uh, most people are not aware of was that in the founding era, there were very significant franchise uh, limitations. Of course, women were not allowed to vote. And, you know, obviously slaves in the South were not allowed to vote. But more, but beyond that, you know, basically in most states, poor people were not allowed to vote. There was a property requirement. And there's a general view that the right to vote was a privilege, or I should say that voting was a privilege, not a right. And, and it was only, um, the, the only people would be able to exercise those privilege would be people with enough education and wealth that they would be able to exercise uh, their vote uh, wisely. And uh, now with respect to the presidency, we now think of the electoral college system as this slightly bizarre way of giving, you know, smaller states more uh, weight for whatever reason. But at the time, it was thought of differently. At the time, what the founders expected would happen and hoped would happen is that the elector would be some, you know, local wise person. That is, you know, imagine like a, a small town and they, the, the founders were thinking, well, the people in this small town or in this county or in this area, you know, they're not very smart, they're not very educated, but at least they'll know who their betters are. And so their betters might be a prominent minister, a banker, a local politician with a lot of experience. And the hope was, was that the ordinary person would select that, you know, notable to be an elector. And then the elector would himself use his own discretion to vote for the president. So it wasn't that people would say, you know, I want you to elect uh, Joe Biden elector, and then the elector would go ahead and do it. The people would just, um, they would just vote for the elector, and then it was up for the elector himself to decide, would Trump be better? Would, be Biden, would Biden be better? I'll, you know, I'll vote for whoever I think I'm better, relying on my wisdom and experience. And so this system was very elitist. It, it was self-consciously elitist. And, the, you know, the founders, well, you know, they, they were kind of hostile toward Great Britain because they were in a war with it. They, they kind of, mo in some indirect ways, modeled their, um, their, their own uh, system on Great Britain, maybe a little more culturally than politically. In Britain, there was this aristocracy. And the aristocracy, you know, was more educated, more sophisticated than other people for all the obvious reasons. And they also had all the political power. And a lot of the American founders, you know, they didn't want an aristocracy. They didn't want royalty. They didn't want people to inherit privileges. But they did kind of want an aristocracy of talent. In fact, Jefferson himself used that word. And some of them, like John Adams, thought that once you got an, uh, kind of an aristocracy of talent going, it would reproduce itself, an, an issue that we talk about a lot today.
Um, and so they had this kind of ambiguous sort of notion that while this would be a republic with limited government and popular sovereignty, ultimately the elites would be um, the ruling class. Next slide, please. So this, almost, this theory of the founders, this approach broke down, you know, almost immediately because people didn't like this idea. You know, the, the revolution had been fought under the banner of popular sovereignty. The leaders of the revolution, who mostly went on to become the founders, said to the people, look, the problem with Great Britain is, you know, they don't care about you. They don't give you any representation or political power. So you should join us in this revolution. Having said that, it, would be, it was difficult for them to back off and say, we need a new kind of elite or aristocracy in the United States. So over the next couple decades, this elitist system broke down. It probably would have broken down earlier, except that Washington, George Washington was an exceptionally popular figure, well-respected, and, uh, and, and you know people liked him, although he was embroiled in all kinds of serious controversies. Um, and Washington, uh, we were lucky with Washington. Uh, he too, by the way, was classically educated, worried about demagoguery. Um, uh, he was quite knowledgeable about the risks of demagoguery. And he set out to be a non-demagogue. And the way he did that was by consulting as many people as possible, deliberating on policy, and trying to be as impartial as, as he could. Uh, acting in the public interest rather than in his narrow political interest. Now, you know, of course, Washington wasn't perfect. He made mistakes and he, he didn't always act in an impartial way, but certainly that was the model that he created. And he was obviously a very successful uh, uh, president. But his successor, John Adams, lacked Washington's charisma, lacked his tact. In, tact. in fact, as I mentioned earlier, Adams actually thought that an aristocracy um, was inevitable in the United States, just because he thought, you know, the talented people would rise to the top and, and engage in what's, what economists call assortative mating, uh, reproducing the smart people and, uh, and, uh, and you know, they'd, ha they'd accumulate money and so be able to educate people, uh, their kids better than the poor. Um, and, uh, and so he actually ridiculously tried to um, create titles, you know, he tried, while he was vice president, he tried to um, enact a law that would require people to call George Washington, his high, your highness. Um, and, you know, this was all completely inconsistent with the spirit of the times. Now, Adams was actually a pretty good president, but he, he blundered terribly. Uh, he, um, he was too sensitive to dissent. And he, although he didn't really um, it was the Alien and Sedition Acts weren't really his idea. He went along with them because he kind of liked the idea of throwing in jail or at least deterring these kind of pesky critics who uh, were, you know, quite outrageous in their criticisms of him and the, and the government, but, you know, basically uh, were, were harmless. And as Adams went after, uh, Adams' administration went after his opponents, the whole country polarized like today, you know, uh, and probably worse, in fact. And eventually this um, polarization results in the party system. The, the first two parties are the Federalists and the Republicans or the Jeffersonians, if you want. Those Republicans are not our Republicans, by the way. Um, the, um, and um, eventually uh, Jefferson, the leader of the Republicans, prevails and creates what's called the Virginia dynasty. Ironically, a, a very much elite system. But you know, what Jefferson, Jefferson made fun of Adams for being an elitist, even though Jefferson himself was an elitist, but Jefferson presented himself and, and believed more in the idea of popular sovereignty. Jefferson believed ordinary people were wise enough uh, to influence uh, government. But in any event, the elector the, both the electoral college and the franchise restrictions eroded during this period. The states passed their laws requiring electors to obey popular opinion. So the electors were no longer elites acting independently um, to uh, you know, prevent ordinary people from choosing someone bad. And then the franchise restrictions uh, eroded as well. Next slide, please. 
this is a, a famous um, painting of um, uh, Andrew Jackson's inauguration. When when Jackson, so Andrew Jackson was, uh, I think, the only Trumpian figure in American presidential history. Uh, although personally, I think he's a bit more admirable than Trump. On the other hand, he did he's done a lot. He did a lot of bad things, uh, both before he became a president and after. Um, Jackson was um, a famous general. He won the Battle of New Orleans, which sort of preserved America's honor in the otherwise embarrassing War of 1812. He was a very effective general. He was an extremely violent, angry man um, and very ambitious. He owned slaves. He, although he was born in a log cabin, setting the kind of fictional precedent, he actually was from a, a fairly prominent family. But he was, as a 13-year-old, uh, a victim of British atrocities during uh, the Revolutionary War. He and his brother had kind of tried to join uh, the American forces, and they were captured and beaten and, and, so, and so forth. So he hated the British. Um, he also hated banks. He was um, a plantation owner, borrowed a lot of money, got in trouble. He fought duels. He killed a couple people. Um, and he was not no friend to the Indians. Uh, who he, uh, he, he led various um, uh, militia, uh, militias against them from time to time. So he was the first, I think, demagogue in the country. He, he in, in our history, he came to power. So what happened, Jackson became very prominent. A lot of people wanted him to become president. When he first ran for president in, um, uh, what was it, 1820, uh, well, I guess 1820, uh, for, for the 1824 election, he, uh, it was like a three-way tie under the old electoral system, a quasi-tie. And the other two guys made a deal which pushed uh, uh, Jackson out, even though he had the largest popular vote. So Ch Jackson called this the corrupt bargain. And never after, he railed against Washington for being a corrupt place. Now, in fact, Washington wasn't particularly corrupt. The national government, by the standards of the time, was quite honest. But Jackson's campaign was basically, you should vote for me because all those guys in Washington are corrupt and I'm honest. He had, you know, some policy proposals, but they were kind of vague. When he was elected, and this is what the picture shows, there was this kind of, you know, the, the White House in those days after an election, they'd let people in for a party. Jackson was so popular that all kinds of ordinary people raided the White House because they, you know, they served ale and tore it to pieces, although in happiness rather than uh, anger. And um, observers at the time thought, uh-oh, you know, we now have popular democracy. This, this is what it results in, this, this like total chaos. Now, Jackson um, was actually in some ways a very competent president. He was a smart guy. He was disciplined. Uh, he, his, his aides, while you know, not terribly honest, were uh, fairly effective. The, but the, the, the real lesson of his presidency is how destructive he was. Um, because he ran as a, as a kind of a Democrat, a, a small d Democrat, he, he had to reward uh, his campaign um, uh, members, the, the people who worked for him, the people who organized. And he did that by giving them offices in the United States government. Needless to say, that very quickly reduced the quality of the civil service. And the, the civil service became extremely bad and corrupt. It would take more than 50 years to repair the damage that uh, Jackson did to the civil service. Um, Jackson, you know, basically, he didn't care about the quality of the civil service, at least, you know, for the most part. He wanted loyal people, and he wanted to reward people who had been loyal to him earlier. The other thing that Jackson did, which was very quite devastating, at the time, the, the United States had, a, had a, something like a central bank called the Second Bank of the United States. The bank was very well run, and it performed all kinds of economic benefits for the U.S. government and for the economy as well. Jackson hated the bank for somewhat obscure, probably biographical reasons, and he decided to destroy it. It took him uh, most of, you know, more than his first term to do so, but he was successful. And in doing so, he badly damaged the American financial system. And it would take another 80 years to repair the damage that Jackson had done. So Jackson was a kind of a populist demagogue. He comes to power. 
by making all kinds of promises to people, accusing the government of being corrupt, and then um, destroying the quite valuable institutions of government because he thought they stood in his way. And that might sound familiar to you. Now, the I irony, of course, is that you, know, you can't really have a democracy in a sophisticated society unless there are elites of some sort running. You know, you got the elected officials are tend to be elites and government bureaucrats are. And Jackson, of course, he, he, you know, he destroyed the old institutions and he drove out the old elites, but he just replaced them with a new elite. And this created the mass party system. Uh, no, that's okay. You can go ahead. This, the mass party system, which is what we have today. So what is it that made uh, Jackson a demagogue? And I, I, I made this kind of very informal table. What did Jackson do and what made him different from people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and even you know, many of our mediocre presidents or ordinary politicians who I you know, call statesmen, uh, maybe, maybe inaccurately, but you, know, you could say, what's the difference between a, a demagogue and a politician? So what Jackson did is he appealed to the negative emotions in people like fear, hatred, and prejudice. And normal politicians in the US, U.S. history tend to avoid doing that. They might use, you know, um, they, you know, they might, you know, they might do it indirectly. They might make illusions. But most normal politicians, they appeal to people's interests, their reasons. They try to invoke uh, positive emotions like solidarity and national unity. Of course, normal politicians seek power, and the demagogue seeks power as well. But most politicians in American history have observed limits that they were not willing to cross for the sake of power. The demagogue doesn't really care about the limits that are built into the legal and constitution, constitutional system. Demagogues tend to be amoral, narcissistic people. While not all politicians are virtuous and prudent, they tend to be you know, reasonably well-adjusted people because they have to rise through the ranks and interact with lots of other politicians as well as their constituents. The demagogue, as we saw with Jackson, the claim to authority, to authority is, is ten, tends to be uh, the attack on the existing system, the establishment of the elites. And they claim authority by saying they have some kind of mystical connection to the people. Whereas ordinary politicians tend to uh, uh, their claim to authority tends to be based on their experience, uh, their expertise, and you know, to some extent, their their moral character. The style of the demagogue is tends to be vulgar. Vulgar, of course, comes from the Latin root for root for crowd, and just it's this idea that sometimes you know ordinary people respond positively to vulgarity because it's it's really a poke in the eye to the elites who, you know, at least publicly tend to try to uh, conduct themselves in a, in a civilized way. They're angry, they're divisive, whereas ordinary politicians tend to be technocratic. And while they do make a appeals to emotion all the time, you know, they're, they're like, you know, they try to, you know, like, as I said earlier, appeal to the nice emotions, the positive emotions. And then finally, the basic attitude to institutions and expertise, it's inherent in the demagogue to be hostile to institutions, the courts, the press, um, the bureaucracy, uh, even you know corporations, um, you know any anything, any kind of organized uh, um, source of power, because all those institutions can be a threat to the demagogue's power. Whereas ordinary politicians, at least publicly, tend to be respectful, even of institutions that they disapprove of or, or disagree with. Um, okay, next slide, please. I'm just trying to see how am I doing in time? I should, it looks like I should speed up a little bit. So let me do that. Um, the, um, so uh, Jackson was replaced by a series of presidents, most of whom were fairly uh, mediocre, but not demagogic. There were some very powerful and successful presidents, including Polk and Lincoln. I'm not gonna talk about Lincoln now, but Lincoln like uh, Washington was very much an anti-demagogue. In the late 19th century, this, um, oh, I have 15, okay. Uh, in the late um, uh, 19th century, there arose in the United States what, what people remember as the populist movement. And it's worth dwelling on them for a couple minutes because of some uh, parallels to, to, 
day. So that's a picture of William, Jen William Jennings Bryan, by the way, who is the great um, orator. Bryan was not actually a populist. He was a Democrat. He was a, you know, he was a card carrying loyal member of the Democratic Party, whereas the populists create their, created their own part, party called the People's Party. But his views were very much sympathetic to those of the populists. And he, he was um, instrumental when the Democrats and the People's Party fused in the late uh, 19th century. So the populists, uh, the received view of the populists, which, are, which is mostly due to a, a famous historian named Richard Hofstadter writing in the 1950s, was that the populists, you know, they hated institutions. They were, they were basically farmers in the South and the West who felt like no one respected them anymore. You know, the country was industrializing, was becoming more commercial. And the farmers who in the past have been regarded as, you know, um, kind of uh, people who are, you know, close to the land and wise and experienced were now being ridiculed as hayseeds. And, you know, they were kind of angry about this. So they got together and created the People's Party with, whose goal was to, you know, undermine the national government and replace it with a whole bunch of kind of cockamamie ideas whose main goal was to, you know, give more power to the and wealth to the to the farmers. Uh, Hof, Hofstetter, interestingly, you know, came up with this view as a way of attacking uh, McCarthy, who I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. But um, uh, the re the reality, according to um, uh, more modern historians, is a bit different and, and a little bit more realistic and, and and much more interesting. So the populists were these farmers, and the farmers were doing very badly in the wake of the Civil War. In the South, obviously, the economy had been destroyed, so farmers were doing very badly. But even in the West and the North, farmers were doing poorly because of the growth of international trade, so they were competing with um, uh, farmers uh, in other countries. And in addition, um, there was deflation at the time. Uh, the country was on the gold standard, and um, that meant that farmers were found it difficult to pay their debts. And then a, a third point is that with the, with the expansion of railroads and banking, farmers were often dealing with a monopolist. You know, they were dealing with a single railroad or a single bank, and they thought plausibly that they were being overcharged or, or treated in a discriminatory way. So, you know, the reality was obviously complicated, but the farmers had uh, legitimate grievances, especially because the two parties completely disregarded them. The two parties, basically, the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, this is the, you know, the Lincoln Republicans, they were, you know, basically fighting the Civil War, even through the end of the 19th century. That's how they got votes, by harking back to that battle. So the Democrats had support in the South, and then they were very successful at obtaining the votes of recent um, immigrants, ethnic immigrants in the cities in the North. And the Republicans, you know, had everybody else. Both parties were kind of focused on business and, um, and, they, and they took the farmers for granted. So the farmers organized, and in many ways, what they did was very admirable. While they were themselves uneducated, they took steps to educate themselves and to hire lecturer, lecturers to educate them. They organized a party, the People's Party, which required a tremendous amount of effort. And then they proposed various reforms, which were, you know, from the standpoint of the 20th century, not that unreasonable. Um, uh, in fact, some of, the, some, some of their reforms are probably correct. Uh, they wanted a more inflationary monetary policy, which made sense uh, given the deflationary um, effect of the gold standard. They wanted more government bureaucratic support but they did use this rhetoric, the, what we now think of as populist rhetoric. They, were, they used excessive kind of um, uh, angry rhetoric. And of course, they, they blamed their problems on the elites in Washington. Um, and, and, and that's what we think of as this uh, populist rhetoric. But, but, um, but and, and you know, some people, you know, populism, under like, under, un, unlike dem demagoguery, has two meanings, like demagoguery is just bad. Populism, it's more, it's a little bit unclear. Populism sometimes means a kind of unrealistic belief that we don't need institutions, an uh, un unrealistic view that we can do without pluralism, um, a view that, you know, basically the people are virtuous. Um, you know, that's unrealistic, but populism also means 
uh, taking into account the people's interests uh, when, at a time when they're being ne neglected by um, elected officials. Bernie Sanders' populism is, is kind of like that. The rhetoric in that case is not as negative. Sanders' argument is that existing American institutions of law isn't doing enough for ordinary people. So, you know, populism has this kind of mixed uh, meaning. Demagoguery does not. And so in the, in the South, we see another group of demagogues. Um, one of them, Tom Watson, Watson was a famous uh, or infamous um, Georgian uh, a, a senator and politician. And Watson became the prototype of the Southern demagogue. Now, what the Southern de what, what's interesting about populism is, is that initially, when the populists were organizing, they thought, oh, you know, we're, we're in favor of farmers in general, and especially poor people. Black people in the South are poor farmers, so they should join our coalition. And Watson himself was, was uh, you know, was, was behind that. He, he actually was in favor of, um, of, give, of, you know, helping black people get the vote and then having them vote with poor white farmers in favor of people like him who would implement a populist agenda. But what Watson and other white politicians quickly realized was it was much more, it was much easier to get power by being demagogues, racist demagogues, and saying to the white farm, the poor white farmers, um, you really don't want to give any political power to black people because, you know, they'll, they'll rape white women and, you know, all the rest. And, and that was persuasive with the result that the, the southern states and, and cities had just this terrible political system for many decades in which, you know, the poor white voters would vote for demagogues who would say horrible things about black people. Um, and uh, and would um, promote white supremacy. But then, you know, once in power, simply um, uh, uh, colluded with the, 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 the existing aristocracy, which is basically planters and new businesses, uh, in, in, in order to, uh, you know, basically keep wages low. So, um, so that's the downside of populism is that it can lead to a type of demagoguery. Next slide, please. So the greatest uh, demagogue, and I mean great in, in the sense of most famous and most effective in American history was Huey Long. Huey Long, uh, Franklin Roosevelt once said that Huey Long was one of the two most dangerous people in America. Um, the other person I, he was referring to was Douglas MacArthur, interestingly. But let's focus on Huey Long. Huey Long was this unbelievably effective, charismatic politician in uh, Louisiana. He was obviously a, a very brilliant person, as well as completely immoral, and uh, also unbelievably ambitious. So as a very young man, uh, he rapidly uh, obtained power because he, had, uh, he hit on a formula, which was basically he could, he could get power in Louisiana, uh, he could rise through the party system, which would take a long time, or he could attack the party system as corrupt, which is what he did. And while he attacked the party system as corrupt, he made all kinds of promises to the poor, mostly white rural uh, farmers, uh, that he would basically, you know, give them whatever. He was a kind of a, a Hugo Chavez type. We will redistribute from the rich uh, to the poor, so, so vote for me. Now, needless to say, he didn't do that, although he did it more than, you know, other people did. He did build ro roads and schools and distributed school books. And there's still a debate among uh, historians about whether, you know, how much good he did do. But the demagogic side of him was not his policy. It was how he got power and how he main maintained power. So he got power by making promises that were, you know, wildly um, beyond what he could possibly keep by using this explosive anti-corruption, anti-establishment rhetoric. And of course, the establishment was corrupt. So, you know, it wasn't entirely, he wasn't entirely wrong. But the problem was that he was corrupt too. And, and his plan was to join at the trough, not to eliminate the corruption. He uh, managed to get complete control of the Louisiana, Louisiana government. So like Jackson before him, he'd install his supporters in um, the civil service. He would, uh, he would, um, uh, Basically, one of the things he did is he made everybody in the civil service sign uh, a letter of resignation and give it to him. And he would he would keep that letter. And if that person ever did anything uh, that uh, Long didn't like, he would just uh, accept uh, the resignation letter. 
he was a tremendously corrupt. He, he took bribes from businesses. He paid bribes to other politicians. Uh, the bribes sometimes took the form of office, offices that he would give to people. He, he became a kind of a, a, a real dictator uh, of Louisiana. Then he went on and became a senator. And, you know, there's these classic stories about Wong in the Senate. He was outrageous. You know, he'd say outrageous things in the Senate. He would interrupt Senate business. And what was odd about this, you know, if you think about this in a naive sense, was he wasn't actually accomplishing anything. He wasn't getting any legislation passed. But that wasn't his goal. His goal was to get attention. And the more outrageously he asked, he acted, you know, he'd do things like smoke cigars in the in the Senate chamber, which was illegal, and so news, which was you know not prohibited, so newspapers would write stories about him, and he became famous very rapidly by being this kind of outrageous, clownish figure. Um, he would do a lot to you know joke a lot, but he kind of play the southern buffoon, uh, although he was not a buffoon, but he would play to the stereotypes of the northern press, and that's what worried Roosevelt. Um, uh, Long ultimately tried to undermine Roosevelt. Um, uh, by supporting a Republican uh, he was hoping would defeat Roosevelt, you know, in 1940 and, and open up uh, a path to power for Wong himself. Um, and, but he failed. Okay, he, he was assassinated. So that never happened. Now, an interesting thing about Roosevelt, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to say this rather than demonstrate it. There are, you know, great presidents like Franklin Roosevelt and um, who do who, who did things that were demagogic. Roosevelt told some famous lies. He, uh, he did occasionally appeal to what I've called the negative emotions. So, you know, this is what makes the subject a little bit complicated. And in modern discourse, this is the, you know, the sort of whataboutism issue. Um, I don't want to give the impression that all the presidents except for Trump have been, you know, paragons of virtue. In fact, I think a big part of being a president is uh, appealing to the emotion and in occasionally engaging in deception. I think that's unavoidable. But there's, a, there's you know, the difference in degree at some point becomes a difference in kind. So why don't we move ahead to the next slide. Um, and um, uh, so a brief word about the new right. Um, so, uh, Another kind of Trumpian figure or demagogic figure was George Wallace, who uh, kind of started the modern practice of attacking bureaucrats. So in the wake of the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt had created this enormous uh, national bureaucracy, which was initially very popular. But Wallace figured out that you know, even if the bureaucracy does good things, and of course it doesn't always, people um, get a little bit irritated from being bossed around by bureaucrats or by uh, people in Washington, politicians in Washington. So Wallace was one of the first to really seize on that theme in modern times. And it was also um, used by both Nixon and Reagan, who, uh, although I don't think either of them were really demagogues, uh, Nixon's a more arguable example, they did exploit this kind of anti-elitist rhetoric that um, goes back to the founding and that is the rhetoric uh, of the demagogue. It's just that, you know, they didn't do it all the time. It, they, they resorted to it in, 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 relative, in, in relatively un, uh, unusual uh, periods. Okay, uh, uh, next slide. Um, okay, well, what about Trump? So, uh, Anil, if you're controlling the slides or whoever, uh, I, I'm gonna ask you to, to just advance it one, Yes. Is Trump a demagogue? Um, why don't you... Uh, um, uh, so, yes. Okay, so Trump is a demagogue. What, what makes him a demagogue? So remember that table I showed you. He appeals to the negative emotions. He tries to uh, create conflict in this country, unlike virtually all previous presidents who at times of strife, would try to do something to appeal to uh, both sides. Um, he, uh, so I'm going to just say click. And when I say click, just, um, it, it, you know, hit the arrow key, okay? So click. Okay, what else? Um, that he seeks, obviously, he's in it for power. Um, 
Of course, everybody who becomes president is obviously very ambitious. But I think if you actually look back at presidential biographies, the vast majority of them are public spirited. You know, they want power, but they want power to do good. Nixon is actually a good example of this. Nixon was very power hungry, but he was also a Quaker or he was, you know, his mother was a Quaker and he had, um, he was idealistic uh, to some extent and hoped as president to put some of these ideals into place. Uh, quick. And his character. Okay. So I think it's fair to say Trump is probably as amoral a president as we've ever had. Many people speculate about whether he's a narcissist in some clinical sense. I don't want to go there, but you know, um, most people we've had as presidents, uh, you know, do not seem like this. Okay, so they seem uh, more uh, uh, like you know more temperate. Let's say, click, and then click again. Okay, the anti-elitist rhetoric is obviously key. Um, this, of course, is something that was also um, played up by Steve Bannon. Quick. And then finally, the attack on uh, institutions and expertise. Okay, so this is this is Trump, uh, an American demagogue. Uh, click. Um, uh, click. So why was he elected? Uh, in the interest of time, we can talk about this. But, you know, the, the basic point about demagogues is democracy is, I think, probably the best political system going, but democracies have weakness, weaknesses. The weakness is, is that the people can elect a demagogue and that the demagogue coming to power can attack um, institutions. Okay, click, and this is our final, I'll go ahead and click again. Oh, uh, yeah. So... There he is. One more click. One more click. Okay. Um, I think I'm about out of time, um, but I but I will, I'll put on the agenda if people have questions. You know, what's next? What will happen if Trump is reelected? Um, I think at a minimum there's going to be a great deal of conflict between president and and Congress. We've seen this before, and I can tell you how I think uh, that might play out. If he's not reelected, you know, I think a, a big question for American democracy going forward is whether other politicians see Trump as a positive model, someone to follow because he, he did successfully get elected. If he does, I think that we're in for some serious problems in our de democratic system. But another uh, more optimistic approach is that other uh, ambitious people who want the presidency will look back at Trump and his, and his administration and say, you know, this was not good for America, and this is not how I want to become president. And if that's the case, then, then maybe we can be more optimistic about the future. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, assuming I can take questions over this, I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, thanks, Eric. That was great. Um, we're going to have a short musical interlude now. Um, while we're doing that, you can collect your thoughts. You can start typing your questions into the community chat so that we'll begin collecting those. Uh, while you're co uh, collecting your thoughts, you can uh, contribute uh, virtually at ethicalhumanistsociety.org slash donate or via Zelle by sending uh, a message to um, donate at ethicalhuman.org. Um, through the generosity of, of these donations, we show how meaningful these programs are. We normally suggest a donation of five dollars you can certainly feel free to give more than that and anything you you give is appreciated um, we we really appreciate everything that everybody in the society has been doing to sustain our community during these these difficult times so we'll be back in a minute with uh, the, the question and answers and in the meantime you're going to see a nice slideshow that Steve Jolstrom has put together <laughs> 
Okay, uh, thanks. Um, we're going to uh, begin with uh, a question that said, uh, the first slides emphasize the original structure of US governance was designed to filter choices by ignorant voters through trusted local leaders. Uh, does, does this suggest the very notion of one person, one vote is fundamentally flawed? Or have we failed uh, in that our, our institutions haven't kept up with this kind of rhetoric? The founders did not really believe in one person, one vote. Um, they, they didn't think in exactly that way. You know, the, the actual notion that one person, one vote really did not firmly enter the U.S. Uh, constitutional system until really the 1960s when the Supreme Court um, expressed this as a norm. And, you know, there are many ways in which our system really doesn't reflect uh, the idea of one person, one vote, such as the disproportionate um, way that senators uh, uh, represent uh, uh, populations. Um, but, you know, you know, I think the found like the founders were 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 they were an interesting mix of realism and, and idealism. They were very much enlightenment thinkers. They were basically um, optimistic about about people. They thought that people um, were um, capable of being educated and um, exercising political influence in a responsible way. Um, and in that way, they broke from the tradition. The Enlightenment uh, broke from the tradition in this way. The tradition was more, you know, people were hopelessly, um, you know, fallen. You know, they were they were sinners, and and they 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 had to be treated like children, governed by priests and kings. So so the Enlightenment view is totally different, and and reflects this kind of mo more modern faith in the way in the capacity of people to, to govern themselves. But as I said, the founders were, were realists. And, and to defend them a little bit, I mean, you, you have to remember that there was no public schooling. You know, a lot of people were illiterate at the time. And it wasn't just that. You know, most people lived on farms. You know, they didn't live in cities. They didn't have any exposure to media. Um, you know, in these rural areas, people might, the, the, you know, the, the, the newspapers might be just a single page long, consisting mainly of advertisements with very little information about the outside world. People work very hard, you know, on the farms and so forth. And so, you know, the founders had this kind of mixed view. They wanted people to exercise political power. They didn't really trust, um, you know, governments in general, uh, if they were just operated by aristocracies or kings. But they also thought that, um, you know, realistically, people without much experience of the world and without much education wouldn't know what to do. And so this is why they thought of a Republican form of government rather than a democracy. Democracy would have meant um, you know, just ordinary people voting uh, the way they do now. Um, that type of democracy was almost a, a negative, had a negative connotation. And the reason was, was that Athens was that sort of democracy and, and, and you know, the historical accounts was that it was pretty chaotic horrible decisions were made. So now I think the more modern view is that more optimistic about the ability of people to participate politically. Um, and, and, you know, I think justifiably so, uh, you know, in some ways people are more educated than in the past. And, and, and in another sense, you can say, you know, even people without wide experience and a lot of education, I mean, they're still smart and they know their own interests and, so they should play a role in, 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 in political outcomes. So, you know, it's complicated. Now, let me just say one more thing. I don't want to drone on too long, but in the 20th century, th this, this whole debate about whether ordinary people are capable of governing themselves, whether they should have, you know, the same amount of political power as, you know, some select elite, it, it, it took on a new um, kind of, kind of um, complexion because the world become, became massively more complicated in the late 19th century and, late 20, and the 20th century. And governments everywhere realized they needed bureaucrat bureaucracies with specialists to make policy decisions. And it was very hard to um, reconcile that idea with the traditional notion of democracy where people, the people make policy, people make political decisions. Um, and, and that's been a tension ever since, you know, and I, and I think the reason why populism is often powerful 
is this notion that bureaucracies or even elected officials have lost contact with the interests of the people and are not not doing the right thing. And meanwhile, ordinary people aren't able to really exercise influence, except from time to time by you know voting in an election, to which to a lot of people doesn't seem to make much difference, maybe because the candidates uh, are very similar. So I, I think we're kind of caught in the same trap as, as, the, um, as the founders. We do want one person, one vote. That is an ideal that we aspire to, but we have to be realistic about the complexity of the world and the necessity of, 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 of relying on, um, I guess, a kind of uh, elite who's developed the expertise that we need to address uh, problems. So the next question follows up very nicely with that, which is, are there institutional reforms that you think we need to shore up our system and protect it from demagogues? Yeah, when I first wrote this book, I, I actually thought about talking about institutional reforms. Um, and there are a number and, 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 and I'll mention them in a moment. But but that said, I, you know, the purpose of this book is, is not really to recommend institutional reforms. It's really, you know, to, it's, it's an attempt to try to talk to people and persuade them that that there's something wrong with Trump as a demagogue and that we don't want demagogues as our president. I, I think it's much more important for people just to think that for, for ordinary people to understand the risks. My worry is, is that a lot of people who might be inclined to support um, a, a president because of that president's policies may overlook the way that a particular president might damage uh, um, uh, institutions so that in the long term, we're going to have a, a worse a worse state. Now, what could you do to, you know, recreate these, these um, bulwarks? Well, I, I talk about this in the book. I didn't mention it in the, in the talk, but in the mass party system that started with Jackson, the, the, the bulwark that replaced, you know, the electoral college was um, effectively the party elites, which would be, you know, uh, experienced politicians, wealthy people, newspaper editors, bankers, other prominent types, you know, there would be these elites at the top of both parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And those party elites would vet the candidates. You know, they would say they would, they, there would, of course, be a popular vote, an election, but the election would be based on the candidates that the party elites chose. So, so, that, so they, could, they could prevent a demagogue from ever, you know, being in an election and appealing to the ordinary people. Now, that, that, that was considered elitist as well and was attacked in the 20th century when pri the primary election system was established. And that was supposed to, you know, democratize and allow ordinary people to have more influence in choosing the candidates rather than just the president. And, uh, and that system was ignored until, the, you know, didn't have much effect until the 1960s and 1970s when in response to the 60s and, the, and Vietnam and all that stuff, um, the primary systems were, were made powerful again. And, and I think that, that led to Trump. Um, I don't think the Republican establishment wanted Trump to be the Republican uh, presidential candidate. So a lot of people have thought, even at the time, people warned that if you remove the party's role in vetting uh, presidential candidates and other important uh, politicians, um, you would you'd get a demagogue or someone like that. And one sort of solution or reform that people have been talking about now is, is bringing back, you know, more party control. Uh, you know, that's certainly a possibility. Um, I'm not sure it's realistic, uh, but, but, but it's a possibility. Now, other reforms, you know, are not so realistic. You can, we're not going to bring back the old electoral college. Um, you know, any reform is going to be attacked as being anti-democratic. Uh, uh, so I, I think that I'd rather... Uh, you know, I'd rather if we're going to if there's any chance of reforming our political system at all, I think rather than focusing on building up, um, you know, bulwarks, new bulwarks against demagogues, I would just support reforms that people have talked about a lot, um, giving more influence to the popular vote, uh, you know, fixing the disproportionate representation in the Senate, trying to reduce the role of money in, in politics and, and, and that sort of thing. I think, 
those are much more realistic uh, reforms, although they're not very realistic to tell the truth. But, you know, they're more plausible than trying to do something that looks uh, undemocratic. I see. Do, do you think in the current context that uh, one party or the other is more likely to produce a demagogue? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think thanks to Trump, I mean, you know, interestingly, demagogues often um, do, are not party loyalists. In fact, Trump wasn't, right? And Huey Long was not. They, they usually, and Jackson was not, they usually attack the party system because the party system is itself, you know, one of these bulwarks that keeps the demagogue out of power. So, you know, if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have said, uh, you know, if a demagogue appears, it might be a demo he might be a Democrat, he might be a Republican, he might start a third party. There are people from the recent past, like Patrick Buchanan and Ross Perot, who were kind of like demagogues, and Perot did start a third party. I think it was called the Liberty Party. Buchanan ran, you know, ran for president under that in that party um, after being a Republican. So, you know, ten years ago I would have said it could be either party, right? It could or or a new party. But nowadays it seems pretty clear that Trump has has left his mark on the Republican Party, and the Republican Party has become uh, less. Um, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how to put this because I I, I promise not to be partisan, but the Republican Party seems to be more receptive to the type of demagoguery that Trump exemplifies than the, than the Democratic Party is. And that's partly because Trump's the head of the party. And so um, people who want to rise in the ranks in the Republican Party, they know that if they can catch Trump's eye and get some tweets of support from him, um, they may well do, do well. And so right now, there are you know, lower level elected officials or people running for office uh, in the Republican Party, who seem quite demagogic, and you know, I'm not an expert on this, but I haven't seen anything similar in the Democratic Party. Um, why don't we take you up on your offer to talk about the future? I mean, the the question that was posed is, do you think the U.S. can survive another four years of the demagogue? But if you want to say more broadly what your your uh, thoughts are on on the next couple of years, that would be interesting. Right. So uh, I've been thinking about this a lot and, you know, you can take different perspectives. I mean, one immediate question is if, if let's suppose Trump is reelected and the Democrats will al almost certainly hold on to the House and, and maybe they would they would obtain the Senate. So I think this would be a dangerous time. You know, a lot of um, presidential si countries with presidential systems like the United States, the the the, the political system breaks down when there's polarization between the presidency and the Congress. Because what happens is that there's gridlock, the public becomes impatient that nothing's being accomplished. And at some point the president might claim dictatorial powers or some kind of expansive uh, powers. You know, I don't see this happening in the United States. I just don't think it's part of our political culture. Our, we have a lot of powerful institutions that would resist that. But there would certainly be, uh, you know, a lot of tension, um, litigation. Uh, uh, it, it would be a very, I think, dangerous uh, time. Um, there would also be the worry that the government wouldn't be able to get much done. So, so I would be quite worried. But, but I think, you know, a lot of people are worried that Trump will become a dictator. I, I don't actually think that, that that's correct. My, my greater worry is just that American political institutions will will not perform as well if the national government is so polarized and, and divided. Um, in the longer term, uh, if he's reelected, as I mentioned briefly during my remarks, my worry is that other politicians will say, you know, this is how to become a president. And if we begin to get, you know, a series of demagogues, maybe Democratic demagogues and Republican demagogues, and, and that becomes the norm, uh, th then, then I do think we're in pretty serious trouble because the political system ultimately functions. Um, you know, it's an interesting, it's a bit like the market. You know, you have political competition, which is very important, competition between the parties because they're, they're both trying to, you know, do the best job so that people will elect them. But they also have to cooperate. And so when people talk about norms 
being broken and degrading, that's what they're referring to. There are all kinds of norms that ensure cooperation between the parties. Um, Trump has attacked these norms, and I think any future demagogue will as well. And as they do so, and as political cooperation becomes uh, less possible, we're going, we would see a, a long-term um, decline in the efficacy of, of our national government and maybe state, state governments as well. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying this is likely. I, I think it's probably less, like, you know, less likely to occur than some kind of reform. Um, after Nixon, there was a great deal of reform in the national government, which made things better uh, temporarily. And um, my, my best guess, certainly if Trump loses, um, that there will be efforts to um, repudiate Trump. And it's kind of interesting to see, to speculate about what they might look like. Um, but l l let, me, let me say two things. I, I do think it's important to, if Trump loses, that the people who gain power, if it's Biden and maybe the Democrats in one or both houses, they're going to have a very delicate uh, problem that they're going to face. On, on the one hand, there's going to be a lot of pressure to punish Trump and people who supported him. Uh, you know, may, maybe that can be done legitimately because Trump has genuinely violated the law in various ways, but, but maybe, you know, there would be an, an effort to kind of drum up something to, to you know, to, to retaliate against him for what he's done. Um, a political trial, in other words. And there's a long history of that. And those things are very dangerous because they tend to increase polarization rather than, you know, overcome it. Um, but I do think that Trump's replacements, his successors, do need to do something to try to repudiate his legacy, the, le the legacy of the demagogue. Um, you know, it, it could be legal reforms, that uh, that maybe reduce presidential power somewhat, uh, bring back various forms of oversight. Um, all of those, you know, might be reasonable. Uh, some people have talked about truth commissions. I suspect that that that's not going to work here in the United States. But but I do think um, it would be important for uh, politicians to distance themselves as much as possible from Trump, and uh, and that it's important for the people with power. To, to somehow, you know, get that going, uh, at least to a certain extent. Okay, here's here's a, a backward-looking question. Um, you skipped over Lincoln, but, I mean, he was certainly um, unhappy with the popular press, and he did jail a lot of newspaper editors. Was uh, was he a demagogue, or was that just an ex that one area as an exception? Well, Lincoln was a dictator. He wasn't a demagogue. <laughs> so, so... So let me explain that a little bit. Um, I, you know, there's a there's a difference between demagoguery and and dictatorship. I, I say that Lincoln was a dictator a little bit tongue in cheek, but it, it's also true to some extent. He was a wartime leader, and he had massive. He claimed massive powers as the executive at the time in the time of war. And you know, historians debate this. But I think the, the general view is that he was justified. There was a war going on. Um, Lincoln, though, was not a demagogue. Like he, 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 uh, he didn't try to abuse his powers, and I'll get to the censorship in a moment. He, um, in fact, you know, of course, famously, he, he ran for election, for re-election, even though he thought he would lose to McClellan because he didn't want to, you know, claim dictatorship. And, and you know, it, it wouldn't have been totally implausible for him to suspend the election uh, in, you know, parliamentary systems, elections are, you know, not held during wars. So, you know, he could have said, look, that's what they do in Britain. I'm going to do it here. But no, you know, he wanted democratic legitimacy. And the reason why he needed dictatorial power was that there was a war going on. So decisions had to be made rap rapidly. They had to be done secretly. And so you couldn't go through Congress the way one does uh, during normal times. And, you know, that's just kind of how the system works. But you know, the amazing thing about Lincoln and the, and the reason why he's not a demagogue, I mean, you know, the, the Gettysburg Address, I, he doesn't, he barely even mentions the South. You know, he doesn't go around attacking the South, demonizing them, calling them horrible the way most wartime leaders would. You know, he says, with malice for none, you know, he says, well, maybe that was his inaugural address. But in any event, he, 
he um, is second in all all dress. Um, all right, I'm running out of battery power, so if, if I disappear, that's that's why. Uh, this is the hazard of using an iPhone. But uh, but um, but he, um, uh, I, I'm, I'll thank you in advance, just in case I, I just totally disappear. But um, but uh, but now with respect to the censorship, and it wasn't just censorship. Um, basically, um, a military military governments were imposed in many parts of the country, in the border states, and in. Ohio and other parts of the states. And it was really at the initiative of the military. The military would, you know, jail uh, uh, Lincoln's opponents and it would censor people. And Lincoln was actually not very happy with that. And he tried to get his generals to be, you know, to use a lighter hand. Um, but he also had to acquiesce to them to some extent. Maybe he agreed with them to some extent. But I think more broadly, he, you know, he, you know, once you give the military the power to keep order, in a particular area, you can't really tell them what to do. I mean, that's that's the nature of civil military relations. So I, I'm actually pretty sympathetic uh, to Lincoln. And I, considering what the world was like, he's amazing. You know, his his you know insistence on on being reasonable, on avoiding you know malice and revenge and you know vengeful talk and all that stuff is is, is actually quite astonishing. And uh, some of you may have read Gary Wills's book on, on Lincoln's address, and it's really fascinating uh, uh, how how much whoops how much restraint he showed at a time of you know extraordinarily extraordinary violence and 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 polarization. If if you want to walk somewhere to try to find a, a charger, we won't judge based on whatever yeah. shows up randomly in the picture. But um, it, maybe I'll do that. One one question we had was. Um, about the whether or not there's a natural uh, tendency for demagogues to appear at a national level instead of a a, a local level, it, it does seem like a lot of what they they do is they milita militate in favor of smaller national government, drain the swamp, all that kind of stuff, uh, where you can point to faceless and unresponsive bureaucrats in a way that you can't really do with your mayor and your school board and, and um, local people. So is, is there something to that? Uh oh, you froze. Yes, there is uh, th okay. very much. So the, uh, the, the, um, the, you know, the founders, uh, you know, dealt with this problem that they wanted a powerful country and they realized that the, the 13 States uh, acting independently uh, are you still there? Yeah, we can yep. hear you. Okay, great. The 13 states acting um, independently could be, were vulnerable. They could be divided by the great empires of the time, including uh, uh, Britain, Spain, and France. Uh, they wouldn't be able to overcome Indian tribes. They wouldn't have a large uh, internal market. So they wanted to create you know, a great country. They even thought in terms of empire. And that meant creating a national government that would override uh, the power of local governments to, to a large extent. But the immediate response from the people who are called anti-federalists was, well, this will just lead to, you know, corruption and abuse because, you know, we already were under the power of the British in London and they did horrible things. And, and basically all you, all you want to do is um, uh, uh, um, move the seat of power from London to Washington. And in those days, you know, Washington was in a sense just as uh, far away as, as London for all intents and purposes. So these anti-federalists were very much um, opposed to a national government or at least the national government that the founders created. And, uh, and you know, they, they lost, but this, uh, you know, this terrible, um, this terrible um, tension would remain uh, uh, throughout history. And, you know, I've often thought that, you know, maybe if we have a terrible polarization in this country, um, you know, it's in a sense, it's countrywide and it's inevitably going to undermine the efficacy of the national government, people's confidence in the national government, because either one side is going to control the government or another side, or they're both going to have to share power and it's not going to get anything done. And so maybe we should, uh, you know, we should, um, uh, decentralized. Maybe more power sh power should flow back fr from the um, national government to the states and the, and the and the localities. 
And, and I think that's a legitimate um, uh, possibility. The, the problem, of course, is that we give up a lot. You know, the, the more power becomes decentralized and the less effective the uh, national government is, then, you know, the more difficult it is for the national government to solve, you know, problems that are countrywide or international. And, uh, you know, maybe that's unavoidable, but, but, but that's, a, that's a significant cost. Okay, I think we've got time for two more questions. So uh, the first is, uh, what options do you think uh, exist if Trump loses but refuses to leave office? Uh, well, you know, it's, it depends. Like, we can game this out. Like, so it's you. You might be pleased to hear that if if he if he loses um, and if he doesn't leave office, you know, his status is basically that of a you know, a tourist who refuses to leave the White House after, you know, the the public uh, opening time, you know, has ended. Right. He under the un, under the Constitution, the the, the first per, the first term of the, the, the president's term ends, um, you know, he's no longer president when his term ends. Uh, so the only way that Trump would remain president would be if the, the, the House accepted the electors and all that, and he was sworn into office by the, the chief justice. So, you know, if he really lost and everybody agreed that he lost, you know, the <laughs> presumably, you know, the Secret Service, which is under the Treasury Department, which is run by uh, the secretary of the Treasury, they'd say, sorry, Trump, you know, you got to leave. You're no, you're no longer president. Now, now, I think that the, the real worry is, I think, more complicated, but, but still serious, which is that he will contest, um, you know, the election in every state where, let's suppose, the vote is close and he'll argue whatever, that mail-in ballots are fraudulent or what have you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm maybe a little more optimistic than other people, but I think, think you know, all of those disputes will go to the courts uh, the courts haven't, you know, the courts, even, you know, the Trump appointees on the courts, they're, they're reasonable people. They're not going to say, oh, you know, Trump lost, but I'm going to rule that, that he won. Um, so the courts will presumably uh, just resolve the election. Um, and uh, like Bush versus Gore, much more complicated. Uh, now, if it's close, uh, then the political um, complexion of the courts could make a difference like Bush versus Gore. But, you know, if he's really just trying to, you know, if he's really kind of obviously lost and he's, and he's just trying to somehow use the courts to convert a loss into a win, I, I don't think that's, that's going to be successful. There's some more complicated scenarios, which um, I don't have, you know, I don't understand. I don't know the law well enough where um, it, it's possible, for example, that highly polarized, Republican-controlled state legislatures might refuse to certify, you know, the electoral vote in their state. I mean, you could imagine all kinds of things happening, but they would have to do that on their own. I, I just don't see Trump, you know, using the powers at his disposal, uh, staying in staying in office. So, you know, I, I think our, our system is robust enough. You know, if you're worried, for example, that Manukin, the Secretary of the Treasury, is going to order, you know, the um, Secret Service agents at the White House to, you know, shoot anybody who tries to remove Trump after the rest of the world agrees Trump has lost. I mean, Tanukin is going to be taking the risk that he'll just, you know, after Trump is eventually carted away, that he'll be arrested and put in jail for the rest of his life for ordering uh, the Secret Service to murder, uh, let's say, judicial marshals. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not going to happen in this country. So I, I realize a lot of people are worried about this. Um, if it's not a close election, I wouldn't worry about it at all. If it is a, a close election, you know, I'd be worried about the, the kind of the chaos. But I, I don't see, you know, I don't see a kind of a straightforward dictatorial seizure of power. OK, so last one's an even uh, more far fetched uh, idea. But uh, somebody's asked your opinion. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the idea of sortition, which is randomly selecting representatives from the population as a way to combat uh, demagoguery. Yeah. You have a view on that? Well, that's what the Greeks did. That's what uh, they did in Athens. And the problem, of course, is that you get, you know, bad people in power. <laughs> Uh, if you do that. So <laughs> I don't think anybody's tried that since the Greeks. I might be wrong. It's It's been a long world history. 
but uh, it's, it's generally the, the view is I, I think it's a reasonable view that you want to you want a, um, a kind of a, a group of uh, uh, professional politicians. You, you want this group to be permeable so that new talent can enter into it. There's a pretty good uh, argument for term limitations to make sure that people don't stay in office forever. Uh, and, and I'm and I'm glad that there's a, a, a term limitation uh, for the for the presidency, but I, you know I don't think uh, you know the the evidence that we have suggests that you know that that's not going to be work that's not going to work very well and certainly it's not going to work for at the level of a, of a country with a population of 300 million people. Okay, well on that we'll we'll say thank you, uh, especially given all the technology challenges. It was it was great that this uh, managed to to come off as well as it did. Uh, the book's fan fantastically interesting, and uh, we, we hope we can see you back soon uh, in person. For more information on these or any of our other programs, you can go to our website, ethicalhumanistsociety.org. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter, or you can subscribe to this YouTube channel to see past speakers in future programs. So to close, let me uh, bring back um, one more uh, thought. Uh, which is uh, a quote by uh, George John Nathan, who said, bad officials are elected by good citizens who do not vote. So thank you, and please join us for the coffee hour.